And if you read ahead and find that Rory dies, this isn't any old future, Amy. It's ours. Once we know what's coming, it's fixed. I'm going to break something because you told me that I'm going to do it. No choice now. Not once you've read it. Once we know what's coming, it's written in stone. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dam, and today we're going to see the conclusion of Series 7, Part A, with Angels Take Manhattan. Written by Stephen Moffat and is directed by Nick Haran. We will also, if I get time to, lightly talk about the short story uh, P.S., written by Chris Chibnall, and also Rory Story, written by Neil Gaiman. Um, now this story, uh, the main story of the, that we're focusing on, Angels Take Manhattan, um, is the conclusion, as I've stated, to Series 7 Part A, the first half which aired in 2012. It also saw the departure of Karen Gillan and Arthur Darwell to the series, and says a, and is a farewell story to their characters Amy Pond and Rory Williams that were introduced in the 11th Doctor story, The 11th Hour, the, the debut story of both The 11th Doctor and the Stephen Moffat era as a whole. So this actually has a lot of gravitas to it. This has a lot of, a lot of, you know, really big important details. It also sees the reappearance of River Song, uh, played by Alex Kingston, which was a big part of their characters. And we need to learn um, in the midway through this era that River Song is actually the baby of uh, of Amy and Rory uh, Williams, making her either Ro uh, Amy, uh, making her either River Williams or River Pond, um, Melody Pond, her actual name is, but you know, it's confusing. Um, and it also as well as a sort of statement to the the conclusionness of this. Uh, this story also features the reappearance of the Weeping Angels. Um, the main villains of the Stephen Moffat era that uh, first appeared in the series three story Blink and then had a reappearance in Flesh and Stone and... Uh, What's the other? Flesh and Stone and... Where's that other one? <laughs> oh, it's on the top of my tongue. Uh, Time of Angels, that's the one. Um, and they've also had a few cameo appearances, most noticeably in The God Complex. However, in that it was a manifestation of one of the characters' fears. Um, but they have appeared in other spin-off media, most noticeably, and for, um, for this marathon, they appeared in the quick read novel uh, The Magic of the Angels. They've also as well appeared in Touch by an Angel, which, which we haven't read. But yeah, they, you know, they are a big figure and it is one of the big staples of Stephen Moffat's career onto Doctor Who. He's the, he's the guy that created The Weeping Angels. It was The Weeping Angels that got him in the showrunner chair, essentially, because it was Blink that made him a basically a superstar in the Doctor Who fandom. So there's a lot of pressure, shall we say, on this story. There's a lot of hype. There's a lot of things this story needs to get down. This story really needs to, uh, you know, has, it needs to get Amy and Rory's character. It needs to deal with the Weeping Angels perfectly uh the doctor and river's relationship which at this point you know uh their timelines are all wibbly wobbly and so the doctor is now from his point of view is coming up not to the end but he is passing the halfway point where he knows more about river song than river song might know about him um or at least it's on an even level um it is stated in this story that she had been now pardoned from her crimes after the man she presumably killed which was the doctor um he technically didn't exist so from this point in the story it takes place from river songs after the after a few occasions after her appearance in a good man goes to war after the impossible astronaut and day of the moon um yeah it's coming up to no point of point of view near the end and um of course, the time of the Angels um, storyline. So, 
yeah, we've got a lot to deal with, a lot of hype. Uh, when this story came out, it was massively popular. It was... Um, a lot of people cited this as a really like great story. In fact, I remember uh, after the story, there was this whole, um, I guess, a fan condition, shall we say, um, P D uh, P P P D P P D, which is a uh, post pond depression, as a lot of fans felt. Uh, really down by the fact that um, Amy and Rory, which for a lot of people who got introduced during this era, would have been their first companions, would have been, you know, the, the, the border of what a companion should be. And the fact that, they, you know, they spent two, uh, two and a half series is worth, which makes them by far the longest companions of the revived era, as Russell T. Davis only had his companions last one, um, one series of the captain of uh, Rose that lasted for two, but different doctors. So, yeah, this was a very popular story and is uh, very cited as a, a really great story uh, by most. But there is a group of people that find the story a bit overrated and is not as well um, good as the story as the people make it out to be. And... I might be one of those people, but let's go, but let's break down um, this story for a moment. Um, now, before I actually get, get into the story, the Series 7 Part A specifically, but mainly Season 7 overall, but Season 7 Part A specifically, was the series which was designed to have the movie poster and movie feel first, and then the story second, with this story taking the film noir approach, which was a very popular film um, franchise, a, a film genre that was very popular during the 1940s and 50s, but had become out of the fashion of a while, and is mainly used as a, as a tribute. When films make it, they usually make it as a tribute to the older ways of how films and and cinema used to work so it's like like a like a um what's the word i'm looking for like a tribute a prestige that's the one a prestige to that older era of of cinema and a great way of the how this story captures that in my opinion is the pre-credit sequence i know a lot of people don't like the pre-credit sequence because uh, it does spoil a lot of the story itself, and the story would have been so much better without this pre-credit sequence where we follow this this character um, who is getting a job for this, basically, I think he's like a mob boss, and he basically wants to investigate this sort of hotel, the Winter Quarry, and has heard something about strange statues, in the building and so this the de uh, detective um you got this monologue you get to see this um montage of him while he's, while he's typing and he goes into this hotel and there's a gloomy atmosphere one thing that really stands out in this story to a degree is nick horan who uh, reprises directing duty after previously directing Asylum of the Daleks, which, if you remember of my vlog of that, I have stated as being one of the best-looking episodes the series has ever made. Like, it's not even comparison. And this story um, is a really, again, a really great-looking story, especially in the use of lighting. It really captures that, that film noir um, presence with the harsher lightings and the more dimmer, uh, dim but harsh lights. Uh, so it captures that thing, and I really like to see a black and white version of this episode. Um, but I feel like here it's not as good as Asylum of the Daleks in terms of his directing duties. There are a lot of issues, especially when we tackle the Weeping Angels and certain bits with Rory. Um, however, again, it could be, uh, with Rory's one anyway, you could pile it up to, uh, the script. Because there's a lot of issues, um, there's a lot of strange issues in this story. Especially when we tackle the Weeping Angels. Uh, but before that, in the pre-credit sequence, which kind of, again, 
completely ruins the story in a sense because it ruins one of the big surprises, one of the big um, selling points of the story, and that is one of the angels in this story is actually the Statue of Liberty in America because this story is set in New York. And then when we cut back into the main story, uh, we see the Doctor Amy Rory in 2012, which... Uh, interesting point of fact in terms of the canon of this. This actually means from Amy and Rory they've gone back in time. Because Amy and Rory have had a few time jumps. In fact, Amy has stated in the previous episode of Power of Three that this whole on and off again relationship with the Doctor has been going for at least 10 years. Though that could also be 10 years from the 11th hour, from the main event of the 11th hour. So... That could be that as well. But basically, um, f from a certain point of view, I think after the God Complex, um, the story was with Amy and Rory actually set uh, in a few years in the future from when they were aired. So going back to 2012 is actually Amy and Rory going slightly back in time. Maybe they were concerned about COVID. It's a possibility. And so, the, um, and so Amy and Rory and the Doctor, they're in New York, they're enjoying it. They actually film these scenes in New York and they look absolutely gorgeous. And Nick Aran really captures that, um, New York. And it does really come out to that movie presence feel when you see how characters in these luxurious shots um, in, I believe, uh, is it called Square Gardens? I'm not too familiar with... Uh, New York geography apart from what I've seen in Marvel movies but yeah the you get to see a lot of famous landmarks um, like there's that famous like fountain with the statues on it a lot of statues here are implied to be weeping angels with a few of them actually sort of being confirmed showing us uh, the first time in the series weeping angels that don't resemble the traditional weeping angels um, something which was kind of teased at the end of Blink that any angel can be any statue of an angel can be in uh, can be an angel, um, and so essentially after a discussion with Amy and the Doctor, Rory goes off wondering. Well, it's the Doctor who's found his book that um, in his pocket um, starts reading along. It's the story of Melody Malone, uh, which we later learn is actually River Song. And whilst the Doctor's reading, he discovers that Rory actually finds himself in the book during, I believe it's the main, the narrative is set during the 1930s. And so the story is, is that this book basically tells them the future and they've got to be very careful with the concept of this book. Whilst they try and chase down Rory, um, who is trapped in the 1920s, um, who, is, um, who has discovered... River Song there and is helping her with this investigation as she's now a uh, detective of sorts trying to figure out what's happening with this crime lord and what does it, what's his whole deal with the Weeping Angels. So that's the main premise of the story. And, and when we get into the nitty and gritty of it, there's some really great concepts here. I love the idea of the book. I love the idea that our characters have basically got this MacGuffin which we can essentially solve every problem. However, it is dangerous. There's a great moment where Amy starts reading ahead and, and the Doctor's just like, No, how dare you? Now I have to break something because you just mentioned I break something. What happens if we find out that Rory dies in the future? Then that has to happen and we cannot change it. Um, as opposed to us finding out something which might lead to his death and we could prevent it. With us reading the book, basically it becomes fixed. It becomes a established point in time. Um, this does kind of go against certain stories during the Stephen Moffat era where we have the whole time can be rewritten. However, this actually does fit well with other stories outside of the Moffat um ideologies of Doctor Who with a lot of stories basically establishing fixed points and stuff and basically setting in stone that when you know something about the future it has to essentially happen so 
that is really good continuity in the sense of the large canon of Doctor Who. Again, it doesn't really work when purely Stephen Moffat because he has had stories where that contradicts, mainly in the Christmas special, the Christmas Carol, where the Doctor messes up somebody's timeline all the bloody time. Um, but yeah, um, but there's a lot of issues here, and I don't know if it's writing or directing. And I, I, I love Nick Haran. Like I said, Asylum of the Daleks, best looking episode by far. Whether, like, it might not be story focused, it might not be um, the best story in terms of a narrative focus, but in terms of a visual appeal, uh, Asylum of the Daleks is easily the best Doctor Who story if you're going by just a visual appeal. Um, but here, there seems to be a lot of errors in terms of how the story looks. Let's talk about the Weeping Angels. Now, the Weeping Angels, when they started out in Blink, were terrifying. A lot of people cited them as the most terrifying Doctor Who monsters of all time. And that's mainly because we got a great grasp of how they work. And when our characters, our main characters who we learn to care about throughout the story, uh, come come at them and we know the rules, we know how, not only how defenseless they are, but also kind of their weaknesses and how little of them they are. But like there's certain stuff like you have to keep an eye on them and like you can't blink, you can't keep your eyes off them. And essentially that like the fact that the story was so consistent with that uh, made the Weeping Angels terrifying. When their next appearance in Time of Angels and Flesh and Stone, um, that was majority still intact, with most angels not appearing like twice in the same scene, with the exception at the very end when they got a bit desperate. Um, however, there is that really awful scene where they start moving, which completely ruins uh, the angels. And here, the the way the scenes are shot, the scenes of actors are placed in scenes and how people treat the angels makes no lick of sense. There are scenes throughout the entirety of the story where no one is looking at the statues and yet they don't move and nobody even seems to be concerned by the fact. Nobody is like petrified, nobody is in anxiety by the fact that there is a weeping angel in the room don't look away don't blink and you might go yeah there's a few people in the room um but there's scenes where it's clearly where it's just the doctor amy and river song in a scene where she's grabbing her arm and every character is looking away from the angel and that the angel doesn't move Again, you know, the whole concept of the camera and the audience can see them, that kind of works. But in terms of the characters in the universe, it doesn't make a lick of sense. And so what that does then, essentially, it completely ruins the angels' atmosphere in this story. There are multiple scenes which would have had a great impact, which would have made us as an audience viewer completely terrified at the fact that our angels are, the angels are closing up. The angels are going to get our characters. However, we know now, um, maybe unintentionally, that the characters can look away and they can just walk out of a room and not really worry about, essentially, always looking at them. Otherwise, because they're so quick that they'll just ca capture them and send them back in time. The sea... The scenes of the Weeping Angels basically lose all momentum because of this, I guess it's, a, I want to say a continuity error or a plot hole of sorts. It's really bizarre. I like, I remember watching this for the first time and being my head scratching by the fact that why isn't anyone looking at the angels? Why is, why, what is going on? Why is nobody even concerned about the fact? We know the angels. The three characters that we interacting with the Doctor, River and Amy, they've met the angels before. They know how the angels work, they know how they deal with. So why isn't like, why aren't they all like staring at the angel or keeping an eye on it? With the exception of the very last time we see an angel in the story, that kind of 
atmosphere, that kind of dread that the angels bring is just completely absent throughout the story. And it's a crying shame. It is a crying shame because I actually feel like they do kind of have a good presence in here in terms of how much screen time they get. They are, they are, they are predominantly in the story. Although for the most time it's just them pulling faces. Um, and their characters also really don't make a lot of sense here. They have, they can teleport people now into other locations and they, and then they can also, they've also built this, um, this hotel, which they've basically farmed as teleporting people back in time. And apparently it's a perpetual source of energy for them. However, it doesn't make a lick of sense because they will grow old and they're going to die anyway. So they'll have to keep getting food. Um, it doesn't gel with the much more efficient angel strategy of the hit and, hit and run. Where they just go around killing people left right, and centre. Taking their Artron energy whilst they throw them back in time. And basically eat all the days that they would have had. Um, like in Blink. And so... Yeah, easily one of the worst factors of the story is how the angels are dealt. But let's talk about this this collector, this dealer that was introduced at the start of the episode and is what a uh, River Song is investigating. Essentially, he's this strange collector and he collects um, strange artifacts. And one of the things which is so pre precious to him that he actually hides it is he has a angel in chains essentially and his character makes no lick of sense and none of everything like with him it just seems really strange and odd there's this whole thing where they basically want to they basically want to get to river song so and they don't know who rory is at this point so they're like okay what can we do about this man how can we get basically ensure that River Song is uh, complicit. How do we get rid of this character? He might tell somebody, but how you know how do we how do we deal with him? And they make this whole thing as oh let's put him somewhere in unpleasant. Let's put him with the babies. The babies, yes. So one of the henchmen take Rory down to the basement. We essentially learn that these babies are baby weeping angels who don't have the energy enough yet to feed off time energy, but they can displace people in space. And so they teleport Rory outside near near the hotel which um, which the weeping angels use basically farm. So the the secret mob boss basically puts the the one of the people you know, like who he's like let's put him uncomfortable let's cap it put him away let's throw him in the dungeon in a bit and you know basically he's our prisoner you send him into a room of monsters that teleport him outside Where's the logic in that? Sure, that scene with um, Rory still trying to survive when you've got the, the baby's angels and you can hear the footstep and you can hear the giggling and that great, great bit where Rory puts the, um, uh, puts the match on only for uh, one of the weep baby weeping angels to blow it out. Great scene, great uh, shot and the use of lighting in that scene is gorgeous. But the sense of the narrative here really lets it down. And let's also talk about, like, there's lots of scenes with Rory in this story, specifically Rory, where he acts kind of curious at something and it leads him directly into the story. Like, it is plot convenience at its... The, the convenient fairy is a full work in this story. Rory teleports outside, maybe like a road or two away from the uh, from this building which the Weeping Angels um, have created. Why the hell does Rory go to the building? 
there is no narrative reason. He just kind of is. He just kind of stumbles on. It just so happens that the that he just randomly decides to walk into this hotel, and it just so happens to be the the weeping angels. It makes no lick of sense. And it's essentially then from this point on he learns basically the same thing. He basically has the same story arc as a detective right at the very opening of the story. We basically learn the same thing, making not only that scene at the start redundant, but also again ruins the flow of the story as as Rory basically learns things that the audience already knows about and the certain things are teased, which the, again the audience already know about. Um, we get then a, we get then a scene of like a um, oh, a really great scene in my opinion where uh, basically River Song is trapped by the angel and the doctor basically states that because Amy read the book um, uh, you have to break now you you something's gonna break and it's gonna be your wrist because uh, Amy read it in the book and now uh, predict the future uh, she basically heard me say this so River break your wrist. Um, to try and get out of it. Um, sure, there's other ways to get out of that. Uh, like, why didn't the Doctor break uh, um, the Weeping Angel's wrist? They do mention it, but the story doesn't really give a good reason as to why the Doctor doesn't do that. And technically, in a way, the Doctor doesn't actually break anything, despite that's the prediction. It's a uh, river, she breaks her own wrist. Um, but I feel like the narrative, the idea is still there and still strong in the narrative, especially when we learn now, um, when we think anyway that River Song actually did get her arm out without breaking it, only to be revealed that she did break it, she just didn't want to tell the Doctor. And we get this really strange scene, which every time I watch I kind of scratch my head and figure out what's going on. The doctor fear, fear fixes uh, River's hand with regeneration energy. Now, despite the fact that the doctor hasn't regenerated in his personal timeline for hundreds of years, I mean, the doctor has been stated to be in 906 by the start of the 11th hour, if I remember my, my facts correctly. And by this time, he's... Um, 1200 so 12,000 sorry 1200 zero, zero. and so he hasn't regenerated for a while so where's that regeneration energy coming from but even okay so he can activate re regeneration energy to fix another fellow time lord if you will uh, I know River Song isn't time lord technically but in terms of how the species works um, in a sense River Song is technically a time lord and how does that affect the doctor she's like oh you stupid idiot um you being so reckless but we never get an idea of what this actually does to the doctor will that mean that he can't regenerate anymore does that mean that when he does regenerate it'll be a bit wonky does that mean that a part of him might not regenerate nothing like this is ever brought up again and it just seems really strange and it just it just doesn't make a lick of sense but i can kind of buy that because you know it you could say it's like a risk or something even though the story doesn't do a good job at establishing it but river Storm's reaction to it where she slaps the doctor in the face again something which i talked about in Simon of the daleks uh in media um abuse towards men has been normalized and that's a disgusting thing um you know slapping anybody is wrong um and the doctor has and the doctor and river have this burst of anger and river song walks out and then amy also then has this massive burst out towards the doctor telling him stick to the science as if like, he doesn't know anything about people uh, specifically river song and i get the idea that, you know she cares about river song because she's her mother, but nothing in that scene implies that that's the case. It just seems really strange, and it tries to pick the, the doctor as a bad guy for no real reason. It's really, it's really head-scratching, 
as to what that scene is trying to say and do. And that scene kind of gets then forgotten about as the Doctor finds and tracks Rory to the, uh, to the hotel. And then here's where the story kind of gets picks up a story a bit more, gets a bit more interesting. Again, the stuff with the angels, um, the threat has become a lot less uh, grounded because of the many issues with how they're shot in the scenes. Um, I don't know if Nick Ryan had any interest with the Weeping Angels or something just, I don't know, something just really went wrong with the Weeping Angels in terms of how they've shot and how they were directed in the scenes. But anyway, the story actually gets interesting when, um, like right at the start of the story with that other guy, uh, Rory actually finds his older version of himself in one of the beds in this hotel and he sees his older self die as the older version is so excited to see Amy back again. So full of like love and ambition of, of Amy that basically tells them that Amy didn't go back with Rory. And so... And the doctor just kind of gives up and is just like, right, there's nothing we can do. The um, Rory is going to get trapped by a weeping angel, going to get sent back in time and is going to um, and is going to be stuck here forever. However, River Song points out that this will create if Rory does find a way to survive this um, and die somewhere else then it will create a massive paradox which will not only kill all the weeping angels but will erase this building throughout time and so they're trying to get out of the building and Rory and Amy find themselves at the top where they get reintroduced to uh, the Statue of Liberty now when they're in the hotel there's this whole stomping sound and all the characters are just like what the hell is that which again is ruined by the fact that the Statue of Liberty appears right at the start of the story. So we know exactly from an audience's point of view what is coming. And let's talk about that. The Statue of Liberty. Now, the, the, the idea of Weeping Angels, of course, is that, you know, nobody... They don't move when nobody sees them, when everybody sees them. But when they, nobody sees them, they can move. Are you trying to tell me... But the we uh, that the Statue of Liberty isn't being seen twenty four seven. It's a strange, strange concept. There's a great line here for like a movie trailer, you know, something that sounds really cool, but really doesn't work if you think about it. There's a line where the doctors is like, New York, it's a perfect place for the Weeping Angels. It's the city that never sleeps. AKA the city that always has its eyes open and has a viewpoint of everywhere 24-7. Not a great plan for, for an alien race that basically move when nobody is seeing them. Do you see, do you see the issue I'm on about here? It's the city that never sleeps and it's a great line. It's really cool. But narratively wise, it doesn't make a lick of sense. And it does kind of ruin. And again... This is another scene in which Amy and Rory are basically debating something and there are scenes, multiple scenes in this scene where none of them are looking at the Statue of Liberty. Nobody's looking at the Statue of Liberty and yet, I mean, I mean, of course, somebody must be looking at the, at the Statue of Liberty. Who the, who the hell's not going to notice the fact that one of the biggest monuments in American history has moved near the shore like yeah but in terms of the context of the scene where it's just Amy and Rory nobody is looking at the Weeping Angel uh, at the Statue of Liberty and the Statue of Liberty does not move in fact it doesn't move at all it goes up to the building and it doesn't do anything it's a really strange and really bizarre however here near the end of the story is where the narrative i think goes really strong here and i feel like this is where stephen moffat his focus was really focused on and was really you know put into good focus and really shows stephen moffat at his best here and that is we coming up to the departure of amy and rory as basically rory decides like okay i've got a plan if i die now if i jump off this building and die then I 
uh, basically kill the weeping angels and but basically kind of as well comforts him in a sense uh, leading to him to his essential suicide is that if the building didn't the bu uh, wasn't invented then maybe he could actually survive this like many of his other deaths which get mentioned and that there's a chance that he could survive and basically he's still like really nervous because you know he doesn't want to fall to his death um he's still you know full of life and energy so he actually gets uh amy to kind of want her to push want him he wants her to push him um but they have this like really great scene where they're crying in their eyes and again despite the fact that the scene doesn't work because none of them are looking at the statue of liberty the emotional hook really is there and amy basically also decides it's like right if you're so confident in this plan if you think there's a huge chance that you will come back to life after this she gets up on the on the edge with her uh, with him and it basically is like right if you come down with uh, if you fall to your death i'm coming with you it's either the both of us or none of us and so just before the doctor and river can run to the edge as as they both you know there's so little time amy and rory jump off the building basically essentially stating that they have picked each other over anything else they have given up everything for their love for their for their for their connection with each other which kind of fixes amy's character from series five in which you know she has that kind of of like the, the love triangle between her uh, rory and the doctor which i really didn't like if you've seen my series five vlogs um and you've got a really great moment you've got that really beautiful music which i actually discovered during this marathon that piece of music actually appears in previous stories there's a quirkier version in asylum of the daleks when amy has a uh, hallucination of the people in the asylum there's also that bit where the doctor's talking about running towards things um that that music plays there as well but then when they fall in in this scene that music is blowing out into just it's just so epic and so cool it does kind of suck that the doctor when he's you know he sees this and he's running and he's like uh no how can this happen and you know he shouts for them he shouts for amy it's like amy don't do this but nothing to rory it's really strange especially again um yeah but anyway so you think that's it okay they they've sacrificed themselves for their love well no they actually wake up in the graveyard which has seen uh was seen previous long uh previously in the episode also uh took place in this graveyard and they did it they stopped the angels from uh from this building and using this time energy using this paradox it destroyed this building and stopped any sort of time energy occurring in that event uh in that particular time zone um kind of implying that's why the tardis was having trouble earlier on in the episode and they're like wow we actually got away from that and the doctor you know he hugs them both um you know he's, he's grateful he's absolutely um thrilled and it's like okay let's get back on its hardest and have more adventures again there's another issue here where rory just kind of gets a feeling or he just you know he just kind of curious or something and he kind of like walks back to a stone which he had like no interest uh no logical reason to be interested in but he discovers in one of the gravestones it has somebody with the same name with him and when he points this out to amy he suddenly vanishes and an angel uh, appears uh, behind where rory was a lot of people didn't like the fact that rory didn't get a big bombastic you know goodbye to the doctor and to the series as a whole but personally i do really love the fact that his ending was just voomp because that kind of is the tragedy of the angels you don't get that farewell uh you don't get that true goodbye in a sense you it, you know in terms of the actual main scene you just get voomp and you're done and that's what makes 
the tragedy of the angels being so quick and this scene is so powerful and it's so well written and you can see like again it does ruin the fact by like the doctor didn't seem to be interested at all by the fact that Rory is disappeared which is really strange um it clearly seems like there's this connection the doctor and Amy have which the doctor doesn't have with Rory it's really strange really odd uh, but apart from that this scene really works and like I said this is the only time in the story where the whole concept of them looking at the angel is really played into effect and Amy is kind of debating it's like right if I let if I turn around if I blink um, I'll be with Rory I can't be the, the doctor again my time with essentially on TARDIS will be done I will be not going back because going back to the 1930s with Rory um, would mean then that the time uh, will mean that uh, because the timeline's all messed up there that she will not be able to meet up with the doctor ever again and so and her love and her appreciation for Rory takes full effect as she says goodbye to the raggedy man the man man in a box from her childhood and the doctor bursts into tears as he has basically lost one of his best friends and River is basically there to comfort him and and basically she also because she has a vortex manipulator she can go back and meet Rory and and uh, Amy and it turns out that Amy was actually the publisher of the book that uh, was the whole more uh, was the, the main MacGuffin of the story and so River basically tells the doctor it's like really there's a last word and we get this really powerful scene in which we have uh, a slow motion of the of Matt Smith running to the last page let's talk about also that last page concept because I actually really hate that it's really out of character for the doctor when he's like basically they establish in this story that the doctor rips out the page uh, the last page of every book he reads because he doesn't like endings what it's the doctor he loves you know solving mysteries he loves you know he doesn't like uh, he doesn't like a mystery in a sense. He likes, you know, figuring out what's going on. That's his whole deal. That's one of the reasons he gets into the adventures like this. Doesn't like the ending of a book. What? He doesn't like endings. That's just a really, in my opinion, that's just a really stupid concept. Um, it might have been like, you know, if you developed it more could have made a lot of sense but in terms of this story it just really didn't ring true for me but it does mean that we get the scene in which the doctor reads the final chapter uh, an epilogue by amy pond which basically tells the doctor uh we lived long we had great lives we lived happily now before we before we actually say true goodbye can you do me a favor go back in time to the young amelia pond and tell her that she's going to um go into all these amazing adventures and the story actually ends um uh, with the young uh, amy pond from um from the 11th hour specifically there's a shot here that's from a dream sequence in the big bang um in which uh, a young amelia can hear the tardis as she's waiting and she and it freeze phases on her and that is um age uh, sorry that is angels take manhattan and overall the story has a lot of issues the, there's a lot of pacing issues there's a lot of scenes which makes no sense the angels aren't threatening and a lot of the character beats and character moments specifically revolving around the doctor and river really don't work and really don't add up however what this story does right is one of the big things the story needs to do right the narrative of the the idea of the noir setting and the leaving of amy and rory and that impact in their story that is handled extraordinarily well and if you are somebody who likes these characters who likes amy and rory like i do you might find a great enjoyment out of this story it's just that a lot of the stuff around it really doesn't add up and really doesn't ring true so that's Angels Take Manhattan. However, as I stated, if I have time, I will be talking about two of the shorts because this story didn't have a prequel like a majority of stories of Series 6 and Series 7. This actually had two sort of sequel stories. One of them 
um, called PS, was written by Chris Chibnall, was a uh, planned scene, um, a planned like short, which was supposed to be part of the Series 7 DVD. However, because of the act of Brian Mark Williams um, was busy at the time, they wouldn't be able to film it. So we actually had the scene uploaded on the internet as storyboards um, with Arthur Darwell doing the narration. Essentially, we basically meet up with Brian again and he, um, despite him being in Amy's house, he gets a knock on the door from a man named Anthony and Anthony uh, gives Brian a note from Rory all the way from the past and it basically ends as a conclusion as Brian became a very important character um, especially in all stories Chibnall wrote in series 7 and you know he was one of the most beloved big characters I'd love to see a live action version of this where we have Mark Williams reacting to the to the note and tearing up and essentially we learn that Rory is just like, you know, there's no way I'm going to see you again. Uh, we are trapped in the 1930s. And we basically have to live our lives um, from then on that point. Um, but we did able to adopt a child. And the person you're talking to, Anthony, he is actually um, your grandson, essentially. So, you know, be kind to him and be gentle. And that's P.S. There's not really much to it. This was absolutely gorgeous. The, the writing here, the, the, the performance by Arthur Darwell, it's just a shame it was never filmed. Why? This was so good. It was so well handled. And it was something which I think, the, the, not really the story um, Angel Takes Manhattan, but in terms of the large Doctor Who universe, especially Series 7, really needed a conclusion to Brian who lost his son during an angel takes Manhattan what the, how did he feel how did he react to not having his son ever again it's a massive tragedy and the fact that you know the scene was never shot I'm so glad that we got it in some way shape or form absolutely gorgeous now next story you're going to be talking about is Rory's story which actually is a tie-in to the Doctor's wife. Yes. How is this? Well, essentially, back in uh, 20... I can't remember if it's 2019 or 20, 2020. But essentially, during lockdown, um, Doctor Who um, had these little shorts uh, to tease up uh, these tweet-alongs, these watch-alongs of particular episodes where a bunch of people will watch the same episode at the exact same time. And they were organised by Emily Cook, who also helped produce these short films. And one of them, written by Neil Gaiman, essentially shows Rory using an iPhone, which um, which is uh, which he kept on him when he went back in time. And you see him in his old like nineteen fifties um, costume, because uh, nineteen forty, sorry, as, as it's just after the war. And essentially. Um, this scene shows Arthur Darwell reprising his role as Rory um, and he's basically talking to the camera and he's talking about Anthony talking to Anthony and his future son who he basically says he's like right we are near the time where we're going to adopt you and I've basically doing these videos to uh, to talk to you about the doctor and how we got trapped in the time and how we're technically from the future and it's all like strange and stuff and he's been talking about all of these build up to the stories and he also talks about how many, many times Rory dies which is a nice little moment and then he's basically leading up to um, the doctor's wife or as he calls it um, when he was called the pretty one only for Amy Pond with Karen Gillan actually reprising her role um, off screen uh, basically it's like Rory come over and help me paint the baby's room and that's it that's basically it it's just Arthur Darwell talking to the camera reading a script by Neil Gaiman but it's so so cool to see it's just so I don't know it's just really cool to see I just love it and so that Angel Takes Manhattan as well as its sort of sequel story P.S. and Rory story um, overall these stories do what they do best which is tackling the Amy and Rory, you know, 
and their their relationship and their closure to the narrative of Doctor Who as a whole. However, in terms of Angel Takes Manhattan, everything else around it really falls flat. It looks, apart from the fact that as well, it looks great and really fits that film noir style. The story really fails on many parts and it is maybe on a purely objective, uh, non-objective point of view. The story does suck. However, if you're somebody who's connected with these characters, who's somebody who do enjoy these characters like I am, I am a real, um, despite my issues with Amy in certain stories, I feel overall I do really like the dynamic of the, doc, the 11th Doctor, Amy and Rory. And so I personally had that great connection. And I guess you could say I suffered from PPD. <laughs> I remember being, I, I suffered from PPD after the end of the story when it first aired in 2012. I was bummed down by this story. It was so sad. It was so tragic. So yeah, that's Angel Takes Manhattan. Uh, P.S. and Rory story. That's goodbye to the ponds. So join me next time where the 11th Doctor will have his first true solo adventure uh, in terms of our canonical point of view. As a more grouchier Doctor, he's investigating this uh, organisation of sorts, I don't know, um, as he gets reunited with an old foe or maybe old friend, um, if you will. So join me next time for The Silurian Gift, and I'll see you next time on The Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-ra!